because we're going to have a ball. I got a special two videos that uh, we picked from YouTube. A lot of times I like to shine the light. I, I love watching YouTube, but I especially like watching and, and seeing that uh, people all around the world put up YouTube about me and my family or me and my whole entire Samoan dynasty bloodline, the whole crew. But we're going to go ahead and uh, play this first video here. And I... We're going to all interact together and, and uh, just enjoy the tape, enjoy the YouTube. I had no no editing to this thing here. Is what we found on YouTube is what we're bringing out here. Now, whether it's fact or, or fiction, well, you're going to hear it firsthand off of, from me tonight. All right, my producer, let's go ahead to back scene. Let's go ahead and roll the footage. Although Yokozuna only competed in the WWE, or the WWF as it were, for around four years, his name has become legendary in the wrestling world. Well, Coming yeah. into the WWF and working through the years when business was down, it's remarkable that Yokozuna was able to cement a legacy in the troubled early to mid 90s World Wrestling Federation. A Royal Rumble winner, a two-time Tag Team Champion, and a two-time World Heavyweight Champion, Yokozuna accomplished a lot during his time with the company. What made Yokozuna unique was obvious. His large size made him a spectacle and a must-see performer. However, it was also this unique trait that led to the ultimate downfall of Yokozuna. Born on October 2nd, 1966 in California, Rodney Anawahi grew up in a family full of wrestlers. Uncles Afa and Sika, the Wild Samoans, trained Rodney to become a professional wrestler. The Anawahi family itself originated from American Samoa, with the siblings becoming known as the Samoan Dynasty. While all members of the family were list. not biologically related, the names that grace the family are indeed extremely noteworthy. Peter Maivia, Umaga, The Usos, The Rock, Roman Reigns and Rikishi all represent the Anawahi clan among others. Afa and Sika were known and respected for developing tough and hard-hitting wrestlers. Yokozuna was really no different. The very first dates we have recorded for Yokozuna matches actually date all the way back to 1985. Working as the Great Kokina, Rodney began working in mid-1985 for International World Class Championship Wrestling, a company that became inactive 10 years later. Puerto the Great Rico. Kokina would all... Well, you know what? I'm, there's a few things I already have. The, you know, that list, I can barely see the list on there, so I have no idea. Uh, who's on that list there of this guy here that's uh uh navigating this or navigating this uh, this video um you know the bloodline is the you know uh, the family of Vanuai. and so let me let me just give you a heads up between myself um uh, my brother the tonka kid my brother ekifatu who is known to the world as umaga uh then you have, you know, my two boys, we know who that is, that's out there, the Usos, and then my younger son, uh, Solo, that's with NXT. And uh, you, my brother, Eki uh, Umanga, he doesn't have any kids that's in the wrestling business uh, yet. Um, he does have uh, uh, four boys, and... Uh, my brother Tonga Kid, Sam Fatu, he has uh, two sons that's in the industry. Uh, most of you uh, probably know him by Samoan Werewolf. Uh, his real name is Jacob Fatu, and he was the MLW champion. And so he's out there on the scene. And then you have uh, Journey Fatu, who is uh, Jacob's younger brother. Okay, so, you know, they talk about on Hawaii bloodline. But, you know, we, my father, of course, you guys know our last name is Fatu, right? So, you know, my father, who is, um, he has passed away, you know, Salofa Fatu Sr. I'm junior. So he passed away, but he married my mother, which was often Sika's uh, sister, okay? So that's how, you know, that's how this is tied into our bloodline. You know as we know it today and you know roman reigns 
Of course, uh, you all should already know who his father is. His father is the Wild Samoan uh, Sika, another Hall of Famer uh, that's in our family. So, so uh, yeah, that's as of watching this tape, you know, up to this part, I wanted to come in there and kind of just validate all that. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and roll the tape. Bonsai. Yes, sir. The CWA in Memphis during 1988. In this same year, the great Kokina went off to work for New Japan Pro oh, Wrestling. Rodney <laughs> would continue to work in New Japan right up until his WWF debut, coming back to America for periods of time to work for the Universal Wrestling Association in Mexico and the AWA in America. A lot of articles online like to point out that Yokozuna had worked in the AWA, but in reality, he only worked four dates for the promotion. When working in the States during this time, Rodney took on the name Coquina Maximus. Fact. Yokozuna, working here still as the Great Kokina, had his dark tryout match on the 1st of September 1992, defeating local worker Ron Neal. He went back to New Japan to finish up his commitments before starting full time with the World Wrestling Federation in October of 1992. He debuted the Yokozuna character in his first TV match and was fed enhancement guys before making his pay per view debut at the Survivor Series in November. Yokozuna was initially billed as being from the Polynesian Islands and weighing in at 505 pounds, and he defeated Virgil here at Survivor Series 92 in around three and a half minutes. As you can see, Mr. Fuji was Yokozuna's manager. Yeah. Yokozuna quickly became a dominating force in the WWF. After appearing on the first ever match on Monday Night Raw, he went into the 1993 Royal Rumble as the favourite and he won the Rumble match after eliminating Macho Man Randy Savage. This victory meant that Yokozuna would be on his way to WrestleMania to challenge the WWF Champion in the main event. Keep in mind that WrestleMania 9 was only Yokozuna's third pay-per-view appearance. He was being booked extremely strong here in his first few months within the company. After feuding with Jim Duggan on his road to WrestleMania, Yokozuna arrived at Caesars Palace to take on Bret Hart for the WWF Championship. Okay. We've so Rodney's been all over, you know, before he made his uh, his uh, debut into uh, the WWF back in the day, right? Uh, as we're watching this footage here, you know, uh, you know, big shout out to the person that that kind of just you know putting this footage of Yoko together, um, but. You know, he he could have been ready long before uh, to come into the WWE at that time. Um, but, you know, to be able to watch some of the, you know, the clips here, that's, you know, that we're all watching him, you know, his journey, you know, up to, you know, to Japan and back and, you know, the different places of the world and so forth. You know, he was very, you know, you can see the size difference and everything, right? But he was very, very agile uh, uh, for a big man. You know, that was one thing that stood out with uh, with Yoko. By the time he came to, uh, you know, the WWE, uh, WWF as the, the sumo character, right? Well, you know, the sumo character, you want to look, you know, be that character and look the size of that character. And during that time when he, you know, you know, he put on the weight, you know, for, you know, that character that, you know, even that after putting on a few, you know, few pounds, he still was, you know, moving, you know, lightning, lightning fast for a guy at his size. Uh, so, you know, he really, you know, paved the way. To, and, I, and I only talk about this for those that are probably, you know, Yoko size, Rodney size, you know. That you know, be it, it don't have to be professional wrestling, football, whatever the case it may be, or basketball. They, you know, uh, you know, sometimes when they see big people, they think that, you know, we're already just, what is it? Uh, they already look at us like we, you know, we can't move, like we're not athletic, like they don't expect us to be light on our feet, quick, you know, lightning speed. They don't expect that from big people right? Big, thick people. And so for you guys that are going through it, 
you know, as we speak, or you've experienced this in, you know, sometime in the past, you know, all you got to do is just keep, keep at it, keep working hard at it, man. You know, and, you know, action speak and bullshit walks, you know, they can think all they want, you know, how slow you are because you're your size. You're not, you know, you're not, you just don't look like the in shape person that would be fast. We don't look like, you know, like eight, we got eight, you know, freaking, uh, uh, six packs on our muscles. I mean, on our stomachs, you know, we don't look like that type of bodybuilder or, you know, like that track star. We just look like some dudes that just love to eat or some chicks that just love to eat and we're all thick, which means we can't move. We're slow. But there you go. Yoko proved them all wrong, and so did Big Keith. So continue to push forward. After Yokozuna right, won the championship, Hulk Hogan used his backstage pool to win the title after the Brad versus Yokozuna match took place. Much is made of Bret Hart's feelings towards the end of WrestleMania 9, but we don't really spare a thought for Yokozuna, who had just won his first WWF championship here, but then had it taken away by Hulk Hogan. Yokozuna, after months of making him an unstoppable monster... Alright, let's monster, go ahead and pause that. Let's go ahead and, uh, you know, we hey, yo, we, we, we all family here. Uh, you know, I ain't gonna, you know, pull no punches on anything. You know, when you, we all kind of see the history of Yoko. Um, or just anybody in your family members. You know, you see, you know their history, you know what they've been going through. And finally, when they, when they get a break in whatever that is in life, in this case, Yoko was, you know, got up and to be able to main event one of the biggest show, you know, on earth. We all know WrestleMania is huge. And so when you get the main event, something like that, and you're just getting there, and to be able to have that, like, you know, not let me have, not let him have his moment. You win it, and then they take it back. For me, like, I don't know. Had that been me, I'd probably just, you know, number one, I probably wouldn't have done it. You know, to build me up and then to take it away like that. Everybody knows who Hulk Hogan is. Hulk Hogan had his time. You know, why not let others shine? Why not let those that, you know, they work their asses off, not to say Hogan didn't work his ass off, but I mean, this is, this is Yoko's time. This was him, him and Brett. This is the first time big man has got up there. Why not let him have his flowers? Why not? So to this day, you know, I will never know. I'm sure Yoko took this to his grave and so forth, but you can rest assured. That you know, I'm always, I'm always gonna be preaching to my people, my students. Ever get an opportunity like that? You, you know, know your worth. Learn, learn to speak up because if they can't, if they can't respect your worth, then you ain't got to be there. It's, it ain't even talk. It, it's not even about money anymore. So okay, uh, big smokes, <laughs> sixty-eight. I got to go with Kishi Much Love at three a.m. in the UK. A big shout out to three a.m. UK, thank you for joining through. I'll stop by and say, you know, very much love. Thank you, man. Thank you for joining and have a good night. Okay, KPE Utah. <laughs> Get a K Fabio name a little. Okay. Hogan was uh scared of the Simone Dynasty and still is. Uh, I don't know about scared of the Simone Dynasty, but I think there's a respect level. You know, we I mean we we're, you know, we're good people, man. We're not no bullies or nothing like that. You know, we um, we just hold our own, you know, and we know our worth. And, you know, let let our stories be, your, you know, be be something for you kids that are watching uh, to learn off. I, you, know, even, you know, even if you're in the wrestling industry or any type of industry, you know what I mean? Then, you know, that you got to keep your pride and to be able to, Stand for something that means something. Nobody walked in your shoes, you know, to help you get there. You did it on your own, too. All right. D DJ Crisco. Bro, I hate it. That ending so much. Yeah, you're right, man. Me, too. Yoko deserved to cherish 
the moment and reign. Yeah, that's exactly, you're absolutely right, man. And that's exactly what my point was earlier, you know? So, you know, let's let's hope, uh, uh, let this, what happened to Yoko be an eye-opening for, for those of you that are coming up in the industry. Just go ahead and, you know, you, yo, stand on your own too. Don't be afraid to speak up. You know, not I'm not saying that Yoko was, but you know, this it, that shouldn't even have been a thought in their mind. Okay, let's go ahead and roll the footage. Hogan in a move that was extremely short-sighted, as Vince McMahon and the WWF would soon find out. I will say this though, in hindsight, what yes, putting say? the belt on Hogan here was a bad move, and it is still somewhat annoying you to think? see today, but watch this back when Hogan does win the belt. You can't say that the crowd doesn't pop huge when the Hulkster gets the 1-2-3. It's easily the biggest pop of the night. I wasn't a fan of this when it happened though, and I'm still not a fan of it today. But even I can't deny that the crowd goes insane when Hulk Hogan wins the belt at WrestleMania 9. Or well, that's because he's a good guy and Yoko had a lot of heat. By the time Yokozuna got his rematch at the King of the Ring in 1993, he had already put on an extra £50 since his WWF debut, and it was noticeable. The Hogan vs Yokozuna match at King of the Ring is, well, it is what it is. It wasn't great. The finish saw a photographer shoot a Hadouken fireball out of his camera, which hit the Hulkster and allowed Yokozuna to pick up the victory. I'm not a fan of this match at all. It's like an extreme example of Hogan's refusal to lose clean. This was all done to write Hogan off TV as he went to pursue some acting gigs but as it would turn out, Hogan wouldn't come back to the WWF and instead he would go to work for Ted Turner's WCW. The takeaway here though, even though the finish was laughably bad, is that Yokozuna could now begin his title run. Hmm. When it became clear that Hogan wasn't returning to the WWF, Vince McMahon's knee-jerk reaction was to try and build the next All-American hero, and Lex Luger would get the honour. Lex's WWF run has been covered already on this channel, so if you want to learn more, definitely check out that video. In short, Lex was getting pushed into the main event, and it all started when he body slammed Yokozuna during a competition initiated by Yokozuna and Mr. Fuji. This led to Lex Luger getting a title shot at SummerSlam, a match that Lex won by countout, meaning the title did not change hands. The post-match okay, celebration here there. is weird to look back. You know, a uh, big shout out to uh, Lex Luger. Um, tremendous athlete, looks in you know phenomenal, phenomenal shape. Uh, is what we call the uh, the total package, right? In the industry, that's that's Lex. He had, he's, he's that got that poster look, that marquee look. <laughs> but I, you know, when they brought Lex in, you know, but uh, man, they they put the gas, they put the fire, everything behind this dude, you know, to push him to that next level, especially coming through, you know, after, you know, uh, after Hogan. And trying to have everything, you know, get that program running with, with uh, brother Yoko, and it's not for me. It's not, you know, Lex's fault. I think it had a combination to do with, uh, you know, a lot of things. But you know, colors of, you know, red, white, and blue. Okay, we, uh, we, we seen that before, right? You know, against Iron Sheik, or Sergeant Slaughter, or, you know, or Hulk Hogan back in the day. So. I, I think it would have probably worked if they just let it uh, would have let Lex come in as himself. That's Lex Luger, as we all know it, rather than trying to put a gimmick on on something like that. I mean, you really when you have a body like that and a person who can talk like Lex, you don't really need to put a gimmick on this guy. You know, just let him let him be himself and let him do his thing. And, you know, to work with a guy like Yogo. You know, I, I know for sure Yoko would have made it work because he would have made sure that the chemistry be, you know, between him and uh, Lex, you know, would, would absolutely work. You know, so, you know, I uh, I was there uh, when when uh, Lex came through. Uh, he did, man, you know, he was there, but he was a lot of time on the road promoting, 
you know, they had, I think they had him uh, uh, his own special bus just traveling around the whole country, like really doing like, you know, uh, campaigning, you know, as if he's running for president or something. But we see him, you know, every time I'd see him, he just looked dog tired when he came to TV. But, you know, that, that was him just trying to make things work. And, you know, um, I just felt like it could have been a better run for him and Yoko had it been done the right way. All right, go ahead, roll the tape. But he's told Lax backstage to still give what? the fans that feel-good moment, only, well, it didn't feel very good. Of note, though, in regards to Yokozuna, is that Jim Cornette was now in his corner. I know people have different thoughts on Jim Cornette, and in particular... Okay, let me pause that right there. To this day, when you all of a sudden see something that's not broken and then you add try to add things to something like that and then next year you know everything pieces start to fall apart you know i i don't uh i didn't understand or even feel that that yoko needed anybody besides fuji with him you know i don't he it just didn't if you look at the the photo and you see Jim Cornette with Yoko, you know, well, I guess they needed, they felt he needed a mouthpiece. Of course, that's, you know, that's most of the time, right? But our Japanese, like, you know, if you're playing that character, that gimmick, wouldn't it be better, more believable, if you have a guy that that's not, you know, working his promo or anything, you know, like Uncle Fuji. That's how he talks. And it just meshed a lot more better with a big sumo wrestler, right? The sumos come from Japan, right? They don't come from Knoxville, Tennessee. So how would a manager from Knoxville, Knoxville Tennessee know? So I don't know. All that just didn't make no damn sense, man. You know, I'm like this. If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, man. You know, all that is is just going to be an extra payday for somebody. Now, instead of cutting the pie two ways, now you got to cut the damn pie three ways now when you didn't need to. All right, go ahead. Roll the footage. D3. What's with this more power? Survivor crack? Series next, and this kicked off the feud between Yokozuna and The Undertaker. During the main event traditional Survivor Series match, Undertaker and Yokozuna brawled and ended up getting eliminated via double countout. This led to the infamous casket match at the Royal Rumble in 1994. This match is recommended, even though there are signs here that Yokozuna's weight is beginning to cause some issues, it's still an entertaining match with a crazy yet memorable finish. During the closing moments, a bunch of heels come to the ring to take out The Undertaker. Taker ended up getting locked in the casket and Yokozuna was declared the winner. Yeah, we all As the, the heels took Undertaker back up the ramp, smoke began coming out of the casket. We then saw Undertaker on the screens and he said to us that we will witness the rebirth of The Undertaker as he floated away from the screen and up to the sky. Also at the Royal Rumble, Bret Hart and Lex Luger managed to eliminate each other at the same time in the final moments of the Royal Rumble match. It was decided that both men would get a title shot at WrestleMania 10, and a coin toss decided who would face Yokozuna first. Lex Luger got the first shot, but he was unsuccessful. Bret Hart, later in the night, would defeat Yokozuna for the WWF Championship. Yokozuna, mm. having worked two matches here at WrestleMania 10, was very slow getting around the ring. He was still putting on weight, and after losing the title at WrestleMania 10, Yokozuna's main event status seemed to fade away. Before dealing with the rebirth of The Undertaker later in the year, Yokozuna had the first ever worked sumo match in the WWF against Earthquake, a match that he lost. <laughs> At the 1994 King of the Ring, Yokozuna and Crush failed to win the tag team titles in a match okay, against the Okay, Paul, uh, highlight that picture real quick. Just like, look at this, just look at this, this, <laughs> this photo. Boy, this is a classic photo. We need to pull this in the high def. Can you imagine what all four? So this is pretty much our crew right here. These are all, you know, 
we all family, we close on the road and, and uh, inside and out the squared circle. Big shout out to Danny Davis, who's a referee right there. And big shout out to, you know, brother Cross, Crush, Brian Adams, rest his soul. And uh, brother Sam Moves right there, Sam Onwai, and there's Big Yoke Dog right there. And there's yours truly. But, you know, when I look at this photo here, man, this is, uh, this really takes me back. Like, this was one of the, probably the happiest and easiest match that I was ever a part of. Because it was, it was really, we just was in there just doing what we do, like, as if we were in the backyard training together back in the day, you know. You didn't have to just, uh, you, you just kind of just looked at each other. You could feel, you know, when it's time to go. And we were actually talking about, you know, how many, you know, how many cheeseburgers we can knock out right now. <laughs> this was a big uh, freaking pay-per-view, and we're in there talking about burgers, talking about food and stuff. And so uh, this match ended up being one of the easiest and probably the fun match for me like uh during my time of career and uh, during my time to uh if you ask probably what's one of my best matches or uh, uh, memorable matches working with yoko this would have to be it right here and big crush man hmm. big brian adams he was such an athlete um i think brian was like six six he looks like he's like you know 260 pounds but he was solid and this who's here from Hawaii. He was uh, a very athletic too for his size and uh, another Uso that was gone too soon. So roll the tape. Drinkers. But by the time Survivor Series came around, Yokozuna had to face The Undertaker in another casket match. This one was okay, not as memorable as the original at the Royal Rumble, but still worth a watch, if only to see Chuck Norris as the special guest enforcer. Yokozuna disappeared after the casket match at Survivor Series, but he re-emerged at WrestleMania 11, where he was Owen Hart's surprise tag partner. Owen and Yokozuna defeated the Smoking Guns here to win the tag titles, but the story here again was wow. the increase in Yokozuna's weight. Yokozuna became a member of Camp Cornette, and eventually Owen and Yokozuna would drop the belt back to the Smoking Guns towards the end of 1995. Hey, Yokozuna was now weighing in at around 660 pounds as he went into 1996. He ended up leaving Camp Cornette in order to feud with new acquisition Vader. He became a babyface as the feud continued, eventually getting wrote off TV when a kayfabe leg injury meant that an actual forklift had to be used to get Yokozuna out of the arena instead of a stretcher. At the Beware of Dog pay-per-views, which had to be filmed twice due to a power outage, Yokozuna and Vader traded wins, with Yokozuna winning in the first untelevised match. During the SummerSlam 1996 free-for-all, Yokozuna's weight caused a rope to break and led to his opponent, Stone Cold Steve Austin, picking up the victory. False. Yokozuna's final WWF appearance occurred at the 1996 Survivor Series where his traditional Survivor Series match ended in a no contest. Vince sent Yokozuna home to try and lose weight, as it was now becoming a health issue. It's been reported that Yokozuna did indeed lose around £100, but it still wasn't enough to please WWF officials. Yokozuna was not cleared to wrestle you. by the World Wrestling Big shout out to Savio there and uh, uh, brother Flash Funk, Scorpio. Okay, roll the tape. Confederation, nor the New York State Athletic Commission, and his WWF career ended. He did continue to work independence, but as the years went on, Yokozuna admitted to trying to put on extra weight to become a world record holder for the heaviest professional wrestler ever. In the end, the last recorded weight for Yokozuna in a professional standing anyway was 760 pounds. He wanted to reach 900. False. In October of 2000, Rodney Anawahi passed away due to fluid accumulation in the lungs. It was wrongfully reported for a long time that he passed due to a heart attack, but this information was found to be incorrect. Rodney passed away in a hotel room in England, as he had been scheduled to work an independent show in Liverpool. 
The sad reality here is that no one can really remain in good health when carrying the kind of weight that Yokozuna did. The even sadder reality is that Yokozuna was only 34 years old when he passed away. As mentioned at the top of this video, Yokozuna's name has become legendary in the world of wrestling, which is so impressive when you consider the man's run didn't really last for a long time. He became one of the most recognisable figures in pro wrestling during the early to mid 90s, a fact that wasn't forgotten by the WWE. He was inducted into the company's Hall of Fame in 2012, where the Usos oversaw the induction ceremony. Um. <clears throat> Uh, big, big, uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's never, never easy. Uh, you know, watching a video of loved ones that's passed away. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, a big uh, uh, shout out to uh, <clears throat> uh, to those that have put this uh, YouTube together. I think it was uh, Wrestling uh, uh, Wrestling Pros, I believe it was. <clears throat> yeah, Wrestling. Uh, there you go, right there, bios, right? <clears throat> um, you know, a few, few things that you know uh, were fact. A lot of things were fiction, you know. <clears throat> um, but you know, just to be able to just to watch, you know, uh, the the work, you know, putting the stories together, and you know, watch a loved one, you know, from start to to finish, you know, and you and you kind of relive that through your, you know, through your mind again, uh, as if we were thirteen year old kids again, ten year old kids, and just starting a, a chance at life, not knowing which path that, you know, this is going to take us. And uh, as we all know today, you know, it, it's brought us to, uh, to you, you know, the professional wrestling world. You know, it's uh, gone too soon, <clears throat> I feel. <clears throat> I still feel that, you know, he should and needs to be here. You know, so you guys could see another side of Yoko. Uh, not just a person that was in the wrestling ring. You know, who knows? He probably would have, you know, had his own, uh, you know, podcast. We probably could have been together on here, Twitch, doing our shows together. You know, maybe, you know, open that other side up, that other door for you fans to come through to see, you know, you know, as big as he was, his heart was even bigger. He just, you know, just loved people. He was a good, good man. When I say good man, like, dude, he just loved everybody. You know, it's <clears throat> not exactly what you see on, uh, you know, the character he plays on, you know, in the wrestling world. It's nothing like who he is behind the scenes. Uh, and, you know, just when I watch that footage, it just takes me back to that, you know, our time, you know, together. You know, our time together with the family, his family, my family, his kids, my kids. You know, a lot of, the, you know, the family time, the barbecues and late night, you know, movie nights and all that stuff. All, all the stuff that, you know, families do. And, you know, you... The one thing that I'm very uh, thankful and grateful is that we got time to spend time a lot with him uh, during his come up, uh, during his you know his whole entire life. You know, you know, you you run into certain cousins and and you know 
friends that you know you 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 know you you hang out with and and you just mesh together, you know. And he was one of those cousins to me, you know. Uh, he was one of those people that you know. Until today, you know, I just don't, you know. I I don't understand like how a person like this with a big heart is not given that second chance to, you know what I mean? Like, you know, talk about when he passed in a hotel, like, I wish I was there. <clears throat> you know, these are the things that I, where was I, you know? Why wasn't somebody in our family or close by with him in the hotel? Like what we always do. You know, when we travel together, we're all together in one room. It could be like five of us. You know, we didn't care. We threw mattresses on the floors. And, but, you know, Yoko would always have the big bed and so forth. But, you know, <clears throat> I know if he was still, you know, I, I know he, he probably wouldn't want us to blame us for what happened to him. You know, he did what he did. He left his mark. And hopefully, you know, his story can be a, a learning tool for for everyone. You know, <sighs> hard work, following your your passion, to believe in in you. Don't listen to what anybody else says because they read the book on the outside but they don't know what's on the inside of that book of what we can deliver. So thank you, big man. Thank you, Oos. Thank you, my brother, Rodney. Thank you, <clears throat> WWE Hall of Famer, Yokozuna, you know, for sharing your life, your story, your wisdom with all of us as we continue to move forward and, you know, carry on your legacy and you will forever be the greatest big man in my book in the world, entire world, entire industry of professional wrestling. <clears throat> and, you know, some of these, uh, you know, uh, these uh, interactions that I do with, uh, you know, the YouTube uh, uh, matches that we put up here, you know, honestly, sometimes it gets hard for me. Well, I just noticed that today. Uh, you know, my other episodes that I do where I interact on certain matches, it was okay. But, you know, when it came to this one here, especially at the end of this footage, it was really, you know, it was really I'm talking to myself that I got to push through this. Like, you know, I mean, this, he's been passed away 12 years ago. And yet something just, you know, just hits me every time I see his face and every time I see a wrestle. You know, it's like I can hear his voice right now. I can hear him, you know, in the living room, you know, on the recliner, like, you know, you know, what's, what are we grubbing on today? What you guys want to eat? You know, let's go buy some steaks, all that, you know? And so this was very kind of hard for me. Uh, this, you know, this, and I noticed something like, you know, moving forward for these episodes or these, uh, you know, uh, YouTube fan interactions with uh, myself, you know, that every time I see, you know, if in case it's a, a film about somebody that's passed away or, you know, like Owen Hart or, or Davey Boy, you know, the British Bulldog or even like Crush, I, you know, I start to feel it right there. That it's, you know, I'm aware that, you know, my feelings are probably going to just come out. And so, you know, for that, you know, I'm just, this is me being real with you guys out there in Twitch. You know, this is where you're going to get it right here. And so, you know, uh, because I want to use my platform you know, to be able to let you guys know who the real deal, who the real person is behind this, what you see right there, that guy right there. And uh, so thank you guys, man. You know, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, you know, my time is almost up here. Um, all love, D-Rez82, I see you. Thanks for opening up with us, bro. You know, no, nah, you know, it's, this ain't no work for me. You know, meaning in professional wrestling, I'm on, it's just straight shooting. You know what we can all I want. I want to use my platform here to, you know, to educate a lot of y'all that are popping through. You know, we all wrestling fans. 
I get it, you know, but some of you guys that are, you know, probably training or even have a thought to, you know, you know, to come into the industry. And it's a good industry. You know, it's a fun industry, but there's just so much that comes with it. You know, you basically, when you sign the dotted line, you sign your life. But, you know, and that's not, you know, you, you got to be well aware of, you know, how, how to be able to adapt and how to be able to, you know, uh, to handle certain situations in this industry because it's not easy, man. You know, I can speak from experience of 35 years of a 17-year-old kid that started training, got shot, wasn't meant to be here in life, dead for three minutes, and two months laid up in the hospital, I already made my decision that it's time for me, it's time to go get it. And, uh, you know, I never look back, you know, I never look back. So hopefully our stories here and our interactions together, watching these, you know, these YouTube films, you know, it's able to, you know, each one teach one. And, uh, you know, again, shout out to a lot of the, you know, the YouTube uh, YouTubers that, uh, you know, put these type of films that we are, you know, watching, you know, every, every uh, episode is going to be like different, you know, uh, different YouTubers. That's YouTube right there, Wrestling Bios. All right, big shout out to you guys uh, for taking the time to edit that, you know. Um, there's your Twitter handle right there as well, Wrestling Bios. Make sure y'all check them out, okay? If you wake up in the morning, you already winning, right? So that's already a blessing already, man, because we ain't promised to wake up tomorrow, really not, right? So, you know, that to-do list that, you know, they say plan properly. Well, how about we just, you know, take it day by day. Some days you feel like it, some days you don't. Some days you feel sick, some days you're all right, ready to go. You know, just do the best you can, man, you know, and just get after it right now. If you wake up, make utilize that, that entire day. Make it a good day for you. Make it a productive day for you. You can't take care of nobody else if you're not functioning right on your own self. 